get started for today. Thanks everyone for coming this early, early Friday morning. Uh, if you have any questions before we get started? Questions, comments? So when we last, last left our story, we were talking about Captain Crunch, who found that uh, a toy inside of a cereal box that was sold uh, here uh, produced a sound exactly at the frequency that he needed to be able to use an authorized long distance call. Uh, so he then went and created this, what they call a blue box, a box that would you could press different buttons on it to produce different hertz frequencies uh, and different sounds. And so that uh, you could use it for, to mimic the inbound signaling of the telephone network. So in this way, they could um, bounce, they could route their calls through different switches in different countries. So they could say, transfer this call from here to a switch in Paris, and then to a switch in Canada, and then to somewhere in New Zealand, and then finally call this number. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is something like, Obviously, AT&T does not like, right? Back then, they were one company, right? It was just AT&T that controlled everything. Um, so he was eventually sentenced to five years probation for phone fraud. Uh, he was caught. Uh, eventually, he was found out and caught. Um, what other things were? Anybody have any experience with phone freaking?
time in, reverse engineered, they borrowed or stole manuals from AT&T employees um, so they could get the information. And they, in my mind, they're kind of one of the first cool, big, really hacking things. Not because they got free phone calls and that's illegal or whatever, but because they, on the outside, completely understood this system. And they were able to manipulate it to do whatever they wanted to do, right? To get free phone calls, to transfer various things. They even had, uh, there's people who could actually whistle these signals correctly to be able to make these calls. Uh, so yeah, that kind of, uh, yeah. So was this device uh, ever known to be uh, built maliciously for this purpose, or what did it just happen to be exactly the same frequency? Oh, you mean the whistle thing? Yeah. Uh, the whistle thing, no, but this blue box, definitely. I mean, the purpose of the box was to defraud. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it came with some kind of instructions, like these are what these frequencies do, or that kind of stuff. I mean, maybe they slightly tried to hide it or something. I, I don't I don't know that much about it, but, um, but yeah, but you know, I mean, I can see from their perspective. I guess the question is, is it really, are they, were they really malicious? work five years in a probation? Yes? No? Why? He deserves an award. Because what? He deserves an award. He deserves an award? <laughs> <laughs> Why? He found out the flaw in the system. Yeah? What else? What, you, what is everybody else saying? They were first penetration testers. First penetration <laughs> testers? What? You can see that, yeah. Did they have the authorization to do that? They did a service. Your AT&T, what do you think that they did to a service? <laughs> did they break any laws intentionally? Did they break any laws intentionally? Um, well, you got phone, had free phone calls without uh, paying any money. <laughs> but if there is a law which says if you can make free things, there was no law which exactly prevented that. Well, can you go? Circuit switching thing? Yeah, circuit switching. What does that mean? They physically route the wires and. Yeah, and even if they didn't physically route it, the point is that when I want to call somebody else, um, the switches in between say, hey, we want to make a connection between these two. And they reserve that voice bandwidth for us on all of those switches so that we can make that call. So if I was ATT, my argument would be you are taking from us, right? You're, you are consuming <coughs> bandwidth that can be used by our paying customers. And you could possibly be degrading the quality of the network for everyone else, right? If other people can't place phone calls because you figured out how to do it for free and you're talking to your significant other in a different country, right? I can see them being, you know, upset about that. But um, anyway, so yeah, there's the legal aspect. There's the, uh, for me, the coolness factor. Like if I was a kid back then, I would probably be doing that. If I knew about it, I, I, can, I know what kind of kid I was, I definitely would have been doing that. Um, but yeah, 
Yeah, but to me, it's more, it is more about that they use their knowledge and they understood the system and understood it so well they got it to do whatever they wanted to do, which is pretty cool. Okay. But it has kind of not nothing to do with computers, but they were kind of the first hackers in some sense. Okay. So now we get into the kind of early warnings right before there starts to be big security problems. Uh, so in 1973, Bob Metcalf wrote an RFC. So what was an RFC again? I think we talked about it on Wednesday. Request, request for comments. Request for comments, yeah. So it's basically a publication to the community requesting for comments. Uh, the title is, The Stockings Were Hung by the Chimney with Care, which is a strange title. Uh, he's clearly not proposing a new uh, email protocol or anything like that. And so his point was, he was trying to warn the community about the impending security problems. He foresaw that, hey, security is really gonna be a problem. We as a community have to start thinking about it, have to start doing it, uh, have to start you know, taking that into consideration. So he, you know, some experts from, excerpts from here that were good. So he said, the ARPA computer network is susceptible to security violations for at least the, at least the three following reasons. Uh, sites used to Physical limitations on machine access have not yet taken significant precautions towards securing their systems against unauthorized remote use. For example, I have to read it from here because pick my neck. For example, many people still use passwords which are easy to guess. Their first names, their initial, their host name spelled backwards, a string of characters which are easy to type in sequence. What's that? X Z X C V B N M. What's that? The lower, the yeah, the lower left of the keyboard just going right. <laughs> so is this still a problem? Yeah. 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 yeah, isn't that crazy? In 1973, he realized, I mean, part of the problem was there was literally ignorance, right? And not in the sense of like people were stupid, it's that they just weren't aware. They weren't used to thinking and realizing, I just connected this machine to the ARPANET. net. That means anybody else on the ARPANET net can try to access my machine, right? Whereas before, these were just machines that you had to be physically present to use, it's a lot easier to secure access when you only have to worry about 20 people maybe using it. So this is still a problem, easy guessable passwords, right? Still a crazy problem. All right, and he went on, he said, uh, the TIP allows access to the ARPANET in a much wider audience than is thought or intended. Uh, phone numbers are posted, like those scribbly hastled on the walls of phone booths and, and men's rooms. Uh, the TIP required no user identification before giving service. Thus, many people, including those who used to spend their time ripping off Ma Bell, so who's he talking about there? No, Ma Bell is AT&T. Oh. So he's talking about the phone freakers we just learned about. So he specifically calls out these same people who were, in his mind, uh, ripping them off, uh, get <coughs> access to our stockings in a most anonymous way. This actually goes back to Eric's story, right? He's saying that they had numbers, phone numbers that you could use to dial into machines, and he's saying that there's no, absolutely no authentication checks or authorization. It's just if you knew that phone number, then you can access that machine. And as Eric demonstrated, you, at the time they had programs that would just enumerate all possible phone numbers uh, in your zip code, or in your area code probably, so you wouldn't get charged long distance calls, until you found one that would let you make long distance calls, and you could try to go out to more machines, right? <coughs> and he says, uh, there, the third problem is there's lingering affection for the challenge of breaking someone's system. This affection lingers despite the fact that everyone knows that it's easier to break systems, and even easier to crash them. So what is this talking about? What, is it, what point is he trying to make here? Earning respect in the hacker community. Yeah, did he see it as a good thing or a bad thing? So yeah, there are people who are really passionate. Um, he says like lingering affection, right? So and, and actually, I think he's 
talking not just about on the hacker's part, right, but also the other people, right? So like we saw, you know, it's kind of cool that somebody built a blue box to allow you to like make phone calls for free, right? Um, but even on the part, I think, of the administrators, too. Uh, so what about that last sentence? Does, do you believe that? Maybe back then, and probably now for bad systems, but yeah. Maybe back then? Even now, what do you think? Is it easy? I don't know. Are there still security problems? How many updates do you have to install a month on your system? A lot. And a lot of those are security vulnerabilities. Um, I guess this leads to an interesting point. So is it easier to, is it easy to break a system versus secure a system? Yes. yes. Some heads nodding. Why? <coughs> because a security personnel has to be right every time and like attacker has to be right only one time. Yeah, exactly. That's actually why I, I love uh, hacking, I love vulnerabilities, finding vulnerabilities and that kind of stuff, but what I like even more is defending, thinking about how do we defend this, because you have to cover all possible attacks, right? The attacker only has to find one weakness to be able to get in, right? Whereas a defender, you have to defend. If I think about it like a castle, right? All they have to find is one brick in the castle that they can poke, and it falls out, and then now they're into your system. Whereas you have to make sure that all the bricks are good, the, more, the mode's good, uh, wherever the waste of the castle's going, somebody can't come into it, right? All these kind of things. Worse than that, because sure. you don't get to monitor the castle anymore most of the time. You give them the castle, say don't break in, and they can do whatever they want to. Win yeah, it's it. tricky. Yeah, you may not even know who's trying to get into your castle, right? You may not have the resources, you may not have the logging, they may be really good. Maybe they can fly, but you have to worry about like dragons coming, like <laughs> dropping people into your castle. So then at the end, he kind of concludes and he says, all of this would be quite humorous. And you can see his RFC is a little bit humorous, right? He's talking about stockings. And it was published in December, so he said, all this would be quite humorous and cause for raucous, is that, am I pronouncing that word right? Raucous, raucous, eye winking and elbow nudging. If it weren't for the fact that in recent weeks, at least two major serving hosts were crashed under suspicious circumstances by people who knew what they were risking. And on yet a third system, the system wheel password was compromised. So what's the wheel password for some systems? Admin. What was it? Admin. Service. Admin, yeah, it's the same as root on some systems. So the wheel account is the root account. By two high school students in Los Angeles, no less. We suspect that the number of dangerous security violations is larger than any of us know is growing. You are advised not to sit and quote, or not to sit, quote, in hope that St. Nicholas will soon be there. So it's a pretty prescient RFC, right? He pretty much saw all the things that were in combination there. He saw where everything was going. And it went exactly the way he was talking about, where now we have to worry about security. We still, you can still have two teenagers in LA compromise your system, right? It happens all the time. Um, yeah, so this was in 1973. This was... Uh, well before the internet exploded, right? This is much more in the early days. And they were still having security incidents, right? People breaking into computers, even back then. So the next famous incident is actually one that's really cool because it uh, reads like a, I mean, it, it reads like a novel and it actually is a novel that you can read. Um, so it starts in 1986. Cliff Stoll was a systems administrator at LBL. Uh, what's LBL? I think it's the Livermore Berkeley Labs. Uh, it's the labs that's associated with Berkeley in Berkeley. Uh, so he was a physics PhD student. And he'd been like getting the computers, getting to C using um, using them to do uh, physics uh, modeling, and he also was a systems administrator for their, their system. 
So on his very first day, he got there on his job, his very first day, and at the time you had to pay for your use of the computer per CPU time. Right, so the first thing you do, he noticed that there was a 75 cent accounting discrepancy between for CPU time. So what would you have done? You start a new job, you show up, there's 75 cents difference. <coughs> I would just be like, it's not, it's not my deal. I just started like, ah, I maybe tell my boss and then like never think about that 75 cents ever again because it's 75 cents and I don't know. Who could care about that? <laughs> would you have looked into it? Would you have investigated it? I'm gonna ask yourself. So what he found out, he started digging, right? He saw the 75 cents, and he found out that an account, somehow an account had been created with no billing address. <laughs> this is impossible. You have to, like, the administrators create accounts. We bill people. We have to have a billing address in there. Otherwise, you don't have a system. So he digs, and he digs, and he digs, and then he finally figured out that there was an intruder on his system. And so what do you do at this point? So you're Cliff. What do you do? Monitor. Monitor? Find the vulnerability that let him in. Find the vulnerability that let him in. Kick them out. Kick them out? <laughs> what are the, pro the pros and cons of those approaches? Well, you kick them out, right? But it could still exploit, I mean, if the vulnerability <coughs> isn't fixed. Yeah, if you don't know how the attacker got in, out of a trap? In what sense? Uh, you make a uh, example uh, transaction and see uh, when he is going to attack and what time he is going to attack. Yeah, so. And understand more about the intruder. Yeah, so you want to understand more about the intruder? Yeah, so I think. From a security perspective, right, trying to defend your network, yeah, you could kick this guy out, uh, this person out, we don't know who it is yet. Uh, you could kick this person out, delete their account, right? Uh, maybe block, maybe you could somehow figure out what phone number they're coming from, so you block access to that phone number. Um, but then... We should identify how he did that and fix exactly. it. Exactly, if you don't know how they got in, right? Somebody else is gonna get in, right? If that one attacker could find something, somebody else definitely can. And that attacker themselves could just use a different phone number and get in, right? Uh, so what he did, he uh, contacted the FBI and he decided to do just that. So he decided he wanted to monitor the intruder to find out who they were and how they gained access and what they were trying to do. Uh, because it's not like today where we kind of know the, what attackers are trying to do on our systems, right? I mean, this was one of the first incidences, right? He was, saw some weird discrepancy and some weird thing on his computer, and he wanted to find out more about it, and the FBI, when he contacted the government agencies, they were like, yeah, you should do that, so we can actually maybe try and catch this person. So what's the risk here, though? I mean, is that, say you're working uh, for Facebook, right, and you find out that a hacker has broke into one of Facebook's database servers. Do you tell them, ah, just let, keep, let the person keep going so we can find out more about them and find out how they got in? <coughs> you, don't know what do with that. Yeah, you don't know what they could do, right? They may damage your system completely. They may wipe all your data. They could mess with the user accounts, right? So by doing this, you're accepting a big risk that, hey, something could go horribly, horribly wrong. And this person, this person who's on your machine could do something incredibly malicious. Uh, could even, I mean, damage hardware if that's possible or something like that. I mean, uh, it's spread throughout your network, right? Because if they're on one machine, what's, who's to say they can't get to another machine? And are you monitoring everything so you're certain 100% of everywhere they are going, right? If you miss one, then they're still in your network and it's your fault because you let them in there for that. If you have encouragement by the FBI, it gets a little bit easier to make that decision, right? You go to your boss and be like, ah, oh, the FBI really wants me to do this, so. Um, plus you can be like, Cliff stole it and he wrote a book about it, so maybe I'll write a book about this. Okay, so it turns out, 
So what he did is he, I believe, put a tap device essentially on the incoming phone line, and he set it up to trace all of the commands and everything that was coming from that phone number. Uh, so he could see, and he had computer printouts of everything that was happening. Um, so what he found out was that the, there was a configuration problem in their version of Emacs. And so <coughs> Emacs worked as a mailer, um, and it used this move mail program to move a user's email from var spool mail, where the system got it in, to the user's home directory, uh, which I did not spell directory correctly. Um, and so there's, so this, this in and of itself is not a vulnerability. Right? There's nothing wrong here. Right? But it turns out that their specific configuration, they had the move mail for, uh, move mail had we're not going to know the details here, but it had root privileges. It had advanced privileges. So it could move and touch any directory on the entire system. Um, so once again, like the software didn't have a problem, right? It's the specific configuration on this specific machine that was the problem. So what the hacker did is it basically with this configuration, MoveMail could allow anybody to move files to any directory of the system. So let's say I give you access to my machine right here to move any file to any directory. What are you going to do? Take over my machine. Don't actually do it, but yeah. Cut it to the user's, huh? it to the user's file. Cut it to the... Uh, create an account in the user's file. Create an account in the user's file? Yeah, so like, uh, I don't know. I think the Mac uses etc password for that, but I'm not actually yeah. 100% Yeah. Yes. A lot easier. Uh, what else? Mess with your passwords, like etc password for Yeah, you can mess with etc password. You could <coughs> uh, add, if I have SSH access on my machine, you could add your key to my SSH authorized users file. And you could just SSH into my machine. Add another GUID or UID. Yeah, you could add another group ID. Add another, you could create a whole new user, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you could change the root user so that it allows logins and change the root user's password. Um, write a keyboard listener that sends me across all your keystrokes. Yeah, you could write, you could inject a program that runs on startup, right? So you could inject a program in there that gives you remote access so you don't even need to modify any of the system settings. You just have, whenever I boot up my Mac, your program runs and now you can just connect to it any time. You can turn on the camera, you can <laughs> screenshot the desktop, all this kind of stuff. So what he did is he used this bug to substitute a new version of the at run program. And this program uh, basically is run every five minutes, I believe. Uh, so this just, and with high privilege. Uh, so basically, it just means that in five minutes from now, whatever program he wants is going to get executed. Because uh, yeah, this is the trick, right? So if you can just move a file anywhere, mm -hmm. how do you know that that file is actually going to be executed by the operating system? Right, so that's why you know if it was Windows, you put it in the startup items folder or whatever that gets uh, executed. And that's off how a lot of viruses uh, and malware does that. And so, but very tricky. After this program executed, it moved the legitimate app run program back. Right. So why did the attacker do this? To do what? Cover up. To cover up. Yeah, to remove the traces, right? So you had to actually see this in the act, otherwise you'd never know that this thing happened. So from there, once on the system, the hacker had administrative access or root access to the system. They created accounts and put in some backdoor programs so it'd be easier to get back in. Then the LBL was also connected to uh, military systems in the mil, mil net, the military <coughs> net. Remember, back at this time, they were both, they were computers that could talk to each other. So then he finds out that uh, this attacker would use that machine, he didn't really care too much about that machine, but he used that machine to then try to connect to military systems on mil net. And they were able to do that, and once in there, they were searching for keywords such as SDI for the Strategic Defense Initiative, or stealth. Uh, strategic Air Command, a nuclear NORAD. Pretty serious stuff, right? It's not just looking for credit cards to try and scam some money or trying to get some free phone calls to talk to your, you know, girlfriend, boyfriend, right? This is like pretty heck, 
uh, heavy stuff. Uh, so this is when he really, I, he, he'd been kind of consulting with the FBI, and up to this point, they've been like, yeah, 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 whatever, like, you know, yeah, yeah, go ahead and do that. But this was like a huge, now it turned into a big deal, because now he realized this isn't a couple teenagers at UCLA or in whatever, in California. This looks like some government. nation state government level hacking stuff, which maybe as you could tell by the title, maybe I should change this title later. <laughs> I feel like this gives it away. Just go to the hacking yeah. incident and I'll and expand then. it. Yeah. At this point I'd be freaked out. So they debated, do they want to pull the plug? Do they not want to pull the plug? Do they want because now you can see that this, you know, they, they still want to catch this person because they want to find out more information about that. Um, so they finally, so what they would do, so this is actually pretty crazy, what he had to do. He had to like, first he had to like live at the lab because they had to start the, <coughs> net, the trace, the telephone trace back to where the call was coming from when the person was on the line. And so to do that, he had to like physically be there in the lab and he'd wait until that machine started printing out which told him that the attacker was there using the system but like that was a huge problem because they were maybe in a different time zone because if you're gonna hack into a system, do you wanna hack into it at uh, you know, nine to five on a Tuesday? <laughs> no, if you wanna hack into it at 3 a.m. on Christmas Eve, when you know nobody's gonna be there and so you're gonna have free reign. Um, so then he actually hooked up a thing so that it would page him when the uh, when an attack, every note of pager is, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> Think of it like primitive text message, <laughs> a dedicated device. Um, yeah, so it would page him when the attacker was on. So then he could set up, call the company and set up the trace. Uh, so that's what they did, and they were able to trace it a few hops. Um, they traced it to somebody in Hanover, in Germany, uh, with the help, he had to get help from FBI and uh, AT&T people, and they had to ask the, um, the German, I don't know if it's intelligence agency or their version of the FBI. Anybody from Germany here? No? Sad. Um, so it finally ended three years later in 1989. So they finally arrested somebody in Germany who apparently worked for the Eastern Bloc at that time. And so he was literally part of a hacker crew where their job was to go search for and hack into US information and uh, US computer systems to look for strategically important information. Um, so yeah, so he was sentenced to a year and eight months in prison and had a 10,000, I don't know what DM, uh, Deutschmarks probably? Yep. Yeah, fine, I have no idea what that is in today's dollars. Um, so yeah, there are other hackers that they found through here. So, why is this story interesting? Was that? Was that? Trying to hack into the military? Yeah, right. Somebody's trying to hack into the military, right? So I think this is definitely one of the instances that led the military to be yank the cord on the Milnet ARPANET collaboration, right? To say, hey, no, we don't want anybody to have access into our system. Why else? Yeah, the sentence is much less than. <laughs> True. Different legal system, though, so I don't know. I don't know that, you know, that's, this is Germany, this is not us. Yeah. Do you get it to contact from the military to hackers? Right, so yeah, the guy wasn't just knocking on military institutions trying to break in, right, the hacker. He first used exploitation of one system and then used that to essentially cover their traces, right, to then try and break into military systems. Because the military system's new, they would trace it back to the Lawrence uh, Livermore Berkeley lab. And they'd be like, why are you guys hacking into our systems? And they'd be like, what are you talking about? We, well, nobody does that. And then they'd have to finally trace it back, right? And realize that something's happening again. The source of threat was configurations in Emacs. And, and it led to something like yeah. that. Tiny, tiny configuration error on one system in a lab that nobody really should care about. It's a bunch of scientists using it, right? I mean, that was probably the administrator's idea is just a bunch of, I mean, professors and scientists on here doing research. Like, why, why would the security of this system be important, right? But it shows that with the internet and the interconnection of networks, right, the security of every system really becomes important. Anything else interesting? Yeah, I, I think it shows that even a single person now had the power to 
access even the biggest of military in the world. So. Yeah, one person, I mean, he had a group, but yeah, one person, right? And it's actually really interesting. Um, so I highly recommend, there's a book called The Cuckoo's Egg that by Cliff stole. Um, and it talks about his account of the incident. It's really, really good. And it's good technically, like he includes enough good technical details that's interesting. It talks about his experience trying to talk to the military. Uh, because honestly, a lot of the agencies just brushed him off. Because at this point, they didn't even know, he didn't even know who to go to. Like, who do I go to about this? Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't until he could prove that it was actually affecting military systems that they started taking him seriously and really wanted to do something about that. Uh, but even then, even when he found that out, so he would say, hey, I have something on my system, you know, an attacker on my system who's trying to access this Air Force server, and he'd call that administrator up, and they wouldn't really know what was going on. Or the problem was some... Uh, default password on the, I don't know if it was a VAC system or whatever that they were running for the military. Like, the basic, basic security things were not being followed. So, it's a, it's a, it's like, um, it's good from a historical standpoint, but it's also actually a good read. Like, I think, I like the way he writes. You actually feel like you kind of know Cliff Stoll. Mm -hmm. um, and now he's like a crazy guy who makes Klein bottles. I mean, not crazy, crazy, but like, um, you know what a Klein bottle is? Like, it's a, um, well, now we're going to look at Cliff Stoll's website. So, uh, yeah, I found it on. There we go. So it's like, um, I, and I'm not a mathematician. Anybody here know what a Klein bottle is? It's like a uh, surface that, like, um, it's it's like a what's that Mobius strip, but 3D. I think is the idea here. So it's got like one surface. So you, make, you can't actually make that because it goes through the thing or something like that. Uh, but he makes things that are like that. Um, let's see, do I have, yeah, I think that's him. <laughs> him and his stylish. Oh yeah, this is crazy. Or not crazy, but like eccentric, I would say, Cliff Stoll. Um, and there's a video of him where he has all of these bottles underneath his house. And so he built a robot, like a controllable robot to like go pick up bottles and stuff. So he's like driving around. Cool video. <laughs> yeah, so weird, weird, but so any more questions, comments on the German hacking incident? Did, did they ever figure out how uh, the guy who was prosecuted ever found that worm in that one lab? Uh, the, not the worm, but the, the bone. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I have to look more closely at it. running Berkeley Unix, because I think he specifically talked about that, but I don't know what the hardware was. I don't know if mm -hmm. the 360 could run. I'm way out of my depth here. Uh, he has, he talks about it in the book, so I don't know. It could have been a known thing, or it could have been a, just a thing. I don't know. It could have got lucky. You could check for. Yeah. You could check for it on systems pretty easily. Yes. So that was actually the thing that they talk about, uh, Cliff talks about in the book, is from looking at what he was doing, incredibly method, uh, methodical. So he would like, like when breaking passwords, he'd have his own list of try, 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 try. And he saw him get on a new system and just try, 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 try stuff, you know. Fail, 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 until something worked. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, I don't think it was, I, I think because he said, because you could like see, it was like keystrokes. I mean. <laughs> well, but your dial-up, so you'd have a uh, dial-up, like uh, Telex was one of them back mm -hmm. then, and you could actually write scripts on the back end for Telex and it would send various commands after mm -hmm. you were Maybe that's what so it could have been. I don't know what that reason. Yeah, I don't know. I think it, it came across as more of like a just, he, they had this very regimented thing of like, this is what they would do, and they do it like daily. It could have been an urban legend. I can't remember now. Like Germany, at that somewhere around that point, had was still all analog when they were switching. Mm -hmm. and so tracing was incredibly difficult. Oh, because a tech would have to go out yeah, and look at the so thing. That was ah. part yeah, yeah, that, that could have been part of what helped why he were could be. why they were even in Germany, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, interesting. Cool. All right, so now we move forward a little bit in time. It's also kind of concurrent, which is weird. Um, move forward to the first internet worm. Whoops, a worm. Now we know, but then they didn't really know. They 
we're not, we're not talking about like a thing you put on the end of a fish hook, right? What's a worm? Or like the dance thing on the ground? <laughs> Yeah, so something that, uh, some kind of malware, it's usually malicious or not good, right? Normal software doesn't do this. Uh, but it goes, accesses another system, copies itself over there, and executes a new version on that other system. And then that one does the same thing, tries to find other people. Uh, so what happened is on December 2nd, 1988, uh, the internet worm was, who we found out later was developed by uh, Robert Tappan Morris, who at the time was a first year, I think he was in the PhD program, First year uh, PhD student at, and I'm forgetting, I think it's Cornell. I think so. Um, his hacker alias is RTM. So, uh, so <coughs> what happened is administrators woke up on, I don't know, woke up on December 2nd and found out that their machines were not working. And they didn't really know why. And then they'd go and look and they'd look at the process list and there'd be a lot of zombie, weird, garbage processes. And so they try to shut up, you know, do what, what do we do when there's a problem? <laughs> shut up. Yeah, reboot. That's exactly what I did here. My stupid mic wasn't working, so I unplugged the USB thing, plug it back in, and now everything magically works somehow. <laughs> uh, so that's what they did. They shut off all their machines, turned it back on, and be like, okay, great, everything's working fine. And, you know, a short time later, it's again, again down and unresponsive, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. And so it was groups at uh, Purdue and Berkeley that really kind of dug in and found out what was going on. Uh, so it turns out that there was a worm. The first worm was released into the wild. Um, and unfortunately, so there was a mistake or bug in the replication procedure. So when it would decide to replicate itself, um, so it proliferated throughout the network a lot more unexpectedly than it should have or the author intended it to. So it, uh, the bug was it would check for other instances of the same worm on the same host, right? Because really, if you're trying to spread, you don't want to infect the same host twice. Actually, this has a lot of um, oh. analogies to biology, right? So um, the problem was if just one worm is on your system, that's fine, right? You're using a little bit of the resources. Right. But if you end up getting 20 or 50 or 100 on there, the system's going to grind to the halt, to a halt. Just like in your body, or the, I don't know, I'm not a biologist, but like, uh, right, so like the virus or whatever wants to spread. It doesn't want to kill the host, really. It wants to spread first. So this is actually bad virus, bad worm behavior, because right. you don't want to knock the host off, because if the host is off, you can't spread anymore from there. Uh, so he had a little mistake where I think it was one out of every seven times that it wouldn't check if another worm was running. It would just run indefinitely. Okay. You know, it doesn't seem so bad one out of seven, but... You know, this is an exponential effect where you have machines infecting machines, and then that machine infects you back, and then one out of every seven times you have something running permanently on there, and then everything goes crazy. So, so how do you fix this? Fix the bug, fix the vulnerability. <laughs> I don't know, what is it? So you fix the vulnerability, and then what? I mean, you make sure that uh, any process that runs needs some set of permissions to run, I mean, so that zombie processes don't run. Anymore. Hard, though. It was <laughs> disguising itself. It was constantly changing itself. It was actually constantly forking and killing its parent over and over, so it had different process IDs all the time. So, try to figure out where it's starting from, like a startup or where exactly. Yeah, so you have to somehow kill the pro, like, kill the starting of the program, right? You really want to fix the vulnerability so that we don't get reinfected. So otherwise, we saw if you just reboot, same thing happens. Um, but the, so part of the problem is this worm had multiple exploitation strategies, multiple vulnerabilities, not just one. So even just fixing one is not really enough. What? Mm -hmm. And it was also doing password cracking and password guessing. So that's not really even a vulnerability. So if you had poor passwords on your home networks, or it would exploit trust between different systems. So if you were able to, uh, not SSH because it wasn't that, but 
the equivalent without a password into another machine, it would do that and use that to spread. So you have to close down all those loopholes too. Um, what happened was, so the researchers figured out what was the problem, they figured out patches, but now how do you distribute patches? <laughs> the internet's down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. The internet's down, right? So they did, they were trying to code some bulletin boards and stuff, but it's almost unfeasible to think about now, but literally the entire internet was down because all, there was all this worm traffic, the worms were making traffic, the machines themselves were down. So they called each other, they organized, they implemented all the patches, and they just turned off the internet. They turned off all the machines on the internet, they unplugged, they cleaned all the computers, and then they brought it back up when they knew the machines were clean. Like, that's how they got rid of it. It's pretty crazy. This is like movie stuff nowadays. Like, like, you watch a terrible movie and they're like, oh no, the virus is loose, we've got to reboot the internet. Like, how would you even do that? Um, so the damages were on the order of several hundred thousands of dollars because you had I mean, uh, estimates, but, you know, I mean, this was, 1988, there was still a decent amount of people using the ARPANET, and so you had all these machines, all these people who had to spend time to fix this thing, and they had machines that weren't available by the users. And you think about what would happen if Amazon was, itself was down for a day. <laughs> How much lost business would that be? Then that's just Amazon, that's one thing. Now think about everything on the internet stopped for one day. It'd be pandemonium, like go buy like water and other supplies because, I don't know, it's like close to anarchy, I think. <laughs> And so they found out it was RTM. Uh, he's actually a professor, uh, so actually he himself has an interesting story. So he was, uh, he was the first person prosecuted under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So he was the very first person. Um, and he got off kind of light, I think, in my opinion. Uh, not that I think it should have been more, but compared to some other people, he only had to do, uh, he didn't do any jail time. He did three years probation, $10,000 fine, and 400 hours of community service. Um, and so he is now, so he started a company called BioWeb in the Boston area, which sold to Yahoo um, for a good amount of money in like 98, 99, I think it was, I want to say in the $40 million range. Um, and then he and some other of his friends, anybody heard of the startup uh, incubator Y Combinator? Yeah, so he's one of the founders of that with Paul Graham. So. Uh, he founded that, and then now he's a professor at, I believe he's a professor at MIT. I should have looked it up, but, um, yeah, so he's also a professor at MIT, right? Yeah. And it, at the time, his dad, when he released this form, his dad was the dr science director of the NSA. Also <laughs> another funny wrinkle to this story. There's all this, like, theories of, like, oh, he was doing it as, like, a subconscious rebellion against his dad or something. This is a complete movie story. Yeah, it's, it's, it is. This is, like, this is what we're talking about, because this stuff's cool. Uh, so part of this, part of the, what the community realized is, hey, we need a way to communicate when there's a massive problem like this. Uh, so that's why they started CERT, which is the Computer Emergency Response Team. Uh, all right, and we'll stop here, but when we come back, so don't come to class on Monday. I'd like to have you here. Uh, no class on Monday, because I'm a generous. <laughs> uh, and when we come back, we're going to learn more details about the actual worm and how it propagated. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>